Hello, my name's Tom Cahill. It's Tuesday the 12th of um, August 2014. Um, I'm just going to quickly extend a little bit of work I've been doing on this um, Woolwich, Woolwich hoax. Um, I have commented on, in the, on it in the past and my comment was that, like, you know, why was it so obviously a false flag or a hoax? Why was it so obvious? And was it a kind of range test to see how stupid the British public are? And how much shit they'll take because you know they are extremely stupid, cowardly, um, spineless, and they kind of like being kind of they seem to like enjoy now getting raped by the powers that be just to make a complete fool of them and they'll just pretend that they believe it even though it's a completely preposterous story. Now, with this Woolwich, Woolwich incident, you've got this man Rigby's which had his head chopped off because he had a t shirt on with a little sign on it, and then these two nasty black men who did this, um, who were up on murder charges went to prison, but now they're calling it a terrorism event, even though they weren't up on terrorism charges. But uh, more information um, gets layered on, and you start realising these people probably don't even exist, and Rigby def definitely did not exist. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about some of these hoaxes, like the Boston bomb hoax, there were all these Jewish actors, and they were all pretending to you know, have these injuries, and they were begging for money. So they've obviously, I would suggest use this as a strategy to get this this scum scum terror uh, you know sort of uh, scum traitorous family these rigbies because there is a family called the rigbies they live up in leeds or somewhere around now um they were had a begging website up immediately now they had a begging website up so soon they had it up the next day after this guy apparently he had his head chopped off, locked off no it is yes it wasn't yes it was no it wasn't you know what i mean then they say it wasn't but um They've also had to incarcerate one of these ladies who's been sickeningly called an angel of Woolwich because she went up and um, attended to this Rigby, who didn't exist anyway. It was just like a dummy, I think, on the ground. And she said, oh, he wasn't badly injured. <laughs> and, of course, he's meant to have his head chopped off. So <laughs> she's now in mentally incarcerated, yeah? So she's been wiped up. I think she was a bit of a nothing. You know, she's like a nothing person, so they've decided to get, get rid of her. Um, so... That, that, that's happened now. It's about more than a year on now since the, the event happened now. So to recap, there's two black men in, who are meant to be in prison, but I don't think are. Um, unlike your normal false flag hoax type things, you've actually got a person who doesn't even exist. You know what I mean? He, Rigby does not exist. This is, can be easily proven by births and deaths amongst lots of other things. And also the fact they keep showing different pictures of different people and saying that's him, that's him. And of course they haven't got any pictures that are plausible of him. And considering he was meant to be a soldier, and that looks doubtful because they based him on a composite of different people, you see, to make it more confusing. Um, there's very few actual pictures of this character being himself with the other soldiers, yet all the other three actors are, I believe, being pictured with all the uh, soldiers and stuff, and they're linked to a British Legion club, which is kind of like a working men's club for people in the army and the police and stuff. It's just a kind of a drinking club, like a conservative club or the Labour club. I don't really think they're very strict about membership, but the Royal British Legion, um, up somewhere up in the north, uh, all these people have been pictured up there, and they've also been pictured wandering around in the back of this apparent murder. So... Um, it's, it's all, it's all, it's, it's, it's an obvious sham. It's deliberately meant to be a sham. But the point is normally, and this is the important thing, normally it's difficult to pin these shams on anybody without like circumstantial evidence. Because what they do is they don't investigate them, they uninvestigate them, so they make sure there's no evidence. So it's very easy to see how they do it. But with this one, it's not just a series of circumstantial evidence and like who gains to sort of guess who, who, who is involved with it. Because Again, some of these people have actually been pictured walking around in the background. Then there's pictures of them at this British Legion club all din dancing and drinking. And they're like, if you're in a British Legion club up in Leeds, and there's lots of pictures of you with all these other people, and then they're all pictured down, down wandering about in the street of this hoax, or they're apparently members of this Rigby's family, it's like, you know, it's just t totally implausible. And they've actually named them. Uh, a lot of them, and you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly obvious. Right now, this this is my angle of it because I, I don't really want to get into the ins and outs of you know the the evidence and hopes because that could go on for a very long time. And there's so many reasons, you know, there's so many reasons to prove it's just complete nonsense. Now, I want to focus on my angle, which is something that I can give an insight, a special insight into, because um, and this was prompted by someone else, and I can explain how that happened as well. But um, I used to work for an organisation called Transport for London, or TFL, which is the people who run all of the London transport, minor stuff like, say, trains that come in from a long way away, 
but any road or anything like that of any significance they manage apart from ones that are run by the boroughs right so the boroughs run the little roads and the TfL runs the big roads and they're called A roads generally speaking and there will be certain pedestrianised areas and stuff that they also manage like I'll give you an example they did do projects in Westminster Westminster West, Westminster Square that was done what's it Parliament Square sorry yeah that was done by TfL um, I think that's actually an interesting story to look into itself because there isn't much of a square at Parliament Square and it cost a good few million more than what um, I would imagine a bit of grass cost to like what to basically put down again. I mean, I don't know even what they were doing, but that was a, I bet that's a scam, but that's just an interesting little aside. So they do actually manage certain pedestrianised areas as well as road areas. Right, so this killing happened on the arteriary road system, so it's a TfL road. On top of that, if you're not familiar with the UK road system, in London, as soon as you get in there, especially right in the middle, all these artery roads have like multi-directional cameras that have got zooms on them. Now, I know that they've got zooms on them, and I know how well they work, because in the TfL offices, when I've worked there, you can actually, on every floor in this, I forget what the building was called now that I was in, you could actually use the little remote controls and lights, or tab through, tab through the different uh, cameras all around London, and you can sort of twist the cameras around and you can actually zoom in. And this is so that the borough engineers can sort of see what's going on in the network at all times. Um, it's a bit weird. It's, it's, you know, it's a very impressive system. You know, ex excellent system, state-of-the-art system. Right, so you've got surface transport. It's the part of TfL that basically isn't the underground. Now, there might be other parts of it which I don't understand, which I'm, I'm missing out here. But in, in basic terms, you've got transport for London. Then you've got the underground, London underground, yeah? And then you've got the um oh what's it called the i forget what it's called it's like the all the over all the over anything that isn't the underground like the overground rail which isn't coming from a long way out um yeah it said all the big roads the tunnels the pedestrian tunnels the road tunnels um the congestion charging cameras the, the traffic the traffic control cameras um what else is it um various pedestrian bits tunnels uh, even the little ferries that go back and forwards across the River Thames and stuff like that, they're all part of, um, you know, overground transport. They're, they're all part of us. Yeah, that's called um, sur surface transport. So that's anything that isn't in the underground, roughly speaking, is surface transport. Technically, TfL is in charge of the underground, but because it's such a big chunk itself, the underground, it's pretty much autonomous but it's not technically autonomous. So surface transport is all run by the same people and it's split into various different departments. I used to work for the road network right now. Obviously you've got things like the boats and the, bu the buses, sorry, the buses, the buses is also part of it. Now, when I was at TfL, and this is going back maybe seven years or maybe even eight years ago, um, I was there for two years and there was this lady called Dana Skelly, very unpopular, didn't even seem to be, she wasn't like a sort of psychopath, because you know that we get these psychopaths who are nice one minute, not nice the next, not nice the night, one minute, not nice the next, <coughs> I'm not talking about like that at all, we've all come across them before, I can think of other people there who are like that, very very unusual people, um, very very untrustworthy, wasn't one of these types of people, so I'm telling you, it wasn't your typical kind of psychopathic behaviour, what it was with her is she was just like constantly unpleasant, and um, she'd be very bossy, very kind of, she's just, she just incredibly horrible. And even if you've seen her walking around, she looked kind of a witch, like a witch when she walked around. Even to the extent there was a situation where me and my little brother were walking around um, at lunchtime, because I've met him for some reason. I think he'd had a day off, yeah, because he doesn't work in London, so he must have had a day off or something. And um, she, yeah, I said, that's one of the bosses. And she, he said, well, she looks like a mental patient. I said, yeah, well, she does look like a mental patient. She probably should be a mental patient. But, you know, they promote these people. And you never really know why. Now, I knew it's for underhand, ridiculous reasons. I knew she did. She's just you're useless, totally incompetent. And I actually had personal involvement of some things that she did, which were totally incompetent. And they were clearly covered up. So why have you got an engineer been put in charge of the whole system when they just make massive great big gaffes all the time and of course then when I use the word gaff you then think well were they gaffes or were they like just saying oh yeah I made a mistake I'll just pay them that extra um, few 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 million and I'll just say I, uh, but, but if you say anything you're all sacked you know that kind of thing so there's a lot of this is often cover for like criminal activity of other types but the point is there's no there's no there's no justification for it uh, the, po the point is with her though is 
um, there was this claim for um, what's called cost price fluctuation. Um, I won't really go into it, it's a bit complicated, but basically she messed up the uh, clause that she got a consultant engineer to help her with. Now she's meant to be an engineer herself, yeah, she's a road engineer, she's, a, she's, she's not like just got them to do it. She, 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 she's, in, she's meant to be in charge of them doing it, but they paid them 60 grand to put these couple of clauses in this contract to do with variation of price. Now that's all to do with stuff to do with like, you know, the steel price goes up on a term maintenance contract. You know, they've got to supply a certain standard on the road for the next, say, 10 years. You can't expect them to price how much it's going to cost because certain things go up and down. So you, you put it on indices. Now, she'd messed this clause up, or the consultant engineers had, but she'd be managing them. And she paid them 60 grand, and it was just to do one clause. And they managed to put this clause and also to buy in the books and basically print them. And it was believed that that was to basically spread the blame out in case anything went wrong. But again, this wasn't something you'd need to pay someone 60 grand to do. This is something anyone could do. It wasn't complicated. Um, I certainly definitely could do it. And, um, you know, it'd just be like, you know, you get a couple of people to check it probably, but it's, it's just not, it's just not a really major element of work. So that makes me very suspicious that they paid someone 60 grand to do it. Right. On top of that, You've got this situation, right, where th this particular um, bit of work, when I was looking into this claim, the whole deal was, uh, and again, this was suspicious, but it's typical of the public sector, um, the contractors have been saying, right, well, we want this much money, we want that much money, because we think you've not paid us enough on the on, the on account payments, sort of as we're coming to the final accounts stage of this contract. And you see, what happened was, um, this was put down for accrual purposes, as a fifty million pound liability, yeah, fifty million pounds. That's what it was down on paper. Now, people don't really have to expect that they're going to have to pay that out, but they don't know, do they? And I think there was five contractors over five areas, or three contractors over five areas. So there's quite a substantial amount of money in it, and they'd all got like um, barristers' opinions and all sorts of stuff. But they weren't just any old barrister; they were like very expensive barristers. And when you pay barristers lots of money, um, there's two ways of looking at it. They've given you the opinion that they think, you know, they that you want, or they're going to give you the opinion that's going to whip up more fees because some of them are getting paid like two thousand pounds an hour. So the public should not be paying two thousand pounds an hour for a barrister to just come up with some ridiculous opinion that doesn't even mean anything. But um, obviously that's how it works. Again, it's just endemic corruption. It's it's designed to be corrupt. It can it can only be corrupt. But so there've been barristers' opinions on both sides. Um, and they were trying to start a court, basically a start a court case over it. And my boss had said to me, well, look, look, this is ridiculous. That barrister's talking nonsense. He's taken a long time talking. If you read what he's written, he's written a lot of stuff. It's complete nonsense. If that goes to any kind of a trial, it would be good for us to go and watch. It'd probably be fun to watch and stuff. He says, and we could get go. But he says, you know, really, it's gross negligence. If we let that go to court because that barrister's just, you know, wanting to get £2,000 an hour, like times or whatever, he's going to make millions out of it. It's absolutely corrupt, he says. Those contracts are going to get back on these jobs anyway because they're the only ones big enough to do it in London. It's just a matter of which ones get bit, which bits of work, you know. Uh, so you know, we, we don't have, we're not going to have to pay them that much money, but it's still down to fit. Probably, you know, they're, they're not going to want to annoy the company by making them look foolish by wanting fifty billion pounds between them because they're going to get on other work. And again, this was a transitory situation, so this hadn't been static all the way along because of course we were retendering for a new term maintenance contract and inviting them to tender and stuff like that so it wasn't it wasn't a transit it was a transitory situation then then what happened was sort of that that this barrister that these barrister opinions so my job was to look at all these different interpretations of what the contract might have meant with this clause all bodged up um get all the information and I was kind of man managing it right and one of the things I was doing was um, putting together graphs that had lots of information behind them, but they could be all laid on top of each other. And when they're laid on top of each other, you could kind of, an idiot could look at it and sort of understand why, what the difference between the different interpretations were, but also you could really dig into the detail. So it's quite a clever task, and it's quite a difficult task. Well, not difficult, but it's a task that took a you know a bit of brains, and it took a long time to actually do it in this presentable manner. So you know, I was given a lot of time to do it. Right, so that was my involvement with it. But one of the things, obviously, I wanted to see is I wanted to see all the email chains going between the consultant engineer and our firm, because of course, if they're if they're li if they're liable, then we can pass the liability on to them. So the accrual wouldn't be fifty million pounds. 
it might be zero, mightn't it? So you might even lose the ability for the accrual, and then there would be no need to take the contract to court, because the contract had a much stronger case, do you see what I mean? They were owed money because the cause had been bodged, there's no question. So, so the thing was, I had to get access. I had to get access to these emails. Well, that's what you know. Obviously, you know, you're doing a report. You know, you're going to have lots of information. You're going to be pulling from here, there, everywhere. If there's been dialogue between the handling person at your organisation and the consultant engineers um, and anyone else who's involved, then you know you're you're going to want to you're not want to have that. And there's no point in you kind of putting together some submission tank, spending weeks doing it, and then finding out that. Um, there's emails contradicting things that you've said because they've made contra agreements and stuff. Now, um, obviously, I was just pretty much dealing with what I was getting given because I wasn't very old at the time. I was only like 23 or something like that. And I had a few files to look through and I went through, put lots of notes in the little... Um, I was kind of got very familiar with them. There wasn't that much stuff, but it, it was... Uh, you know, a, a leverage file full of stuff. But the thing is, obviously, I wanted to get these emails. Now, this lady had been dealing with all the emails, right? And the 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 emails that she'd been dealing with the consultant architect. Now, I had a few of them in this file, and they were all just look like like kind of text language. Now, this is not look, if you're paying someone sixty grand to do something, you are a, an engineer yourself. You're a proper engineer who's worked on the roads for a long time. You know, you, you, you don't write kind of text language. You don't write like just one line and have that kind of like, you know, an agreement. It, it was it was very sloppy. It looked, you know, like, yeah, recklessly sloppy, which was, this is something that characterized everything that this woman used to do. Um, but the point was, somebody said, oh, no, no, there's been a legal question about whether you can look at her emails. And it's like, right, okay, so there's a legal question about whether you can look at her emails. Now, if I'm working for a firm, she was an employee, right? She's an employee of the firm in a structural position, and she'd also been a point of, a point of contact on that. Why on earth? Why on earth would you need to get a legal opinion to look at her emails? Now, I could understand that if she hadn't realised that work emails are work emails and belong to work emails, and it was about something to do with like her dog going to the vet or some kind of problem she had that she was talking to maybe a doctor about. That's different. This wasn't. This was to do with a contract price fluctuation clause with a consultant engineer, right? So there's absolutely zero justification for it. And obviously, legally, she hasn't got any foot leg to stand on, because even if it was about a sick dog or whatever to a vet, then you still could look at it anyway. That, that's, the actual, that's the actual truth of the matter. So it was very unusual they were talking about getting legal advice about whether they could get her to hand over emails. Surely she should just give over her emails, but sh she wasn't going to do that. Right now, this thing I kept hearing bits and pieces about it, but when you work in these big firms, there's a lot of corrupt stuff going on. I mean, this girl used to sit across from me, um, and her dad had basically got a job, her job as a consultant there, I believe, getting like £350 a day or something. So she just left school, and he's just got her job getting £350 a day. And he, she, he'd be in his office, and she'd be sort of in the kind of office outside his office, because the top ones get to sort of hide in these little offices. Everyone else is an open plan bit. And um, she'd talk about her dad one day, and then Chris the next, and I was like, She'd sort of have two different personas about it. It's very embarrassing, but you see, this is the thing. I forget the other. I know he's called Chris, but it's just absolute bentness on bentness. And the whole point is these things are set up to be bent. I mean, I went out and visited one job, and um, this guy, Chris Christostomu, right, had, um, had decided he was like he was a borough engineer, but we were kind of doing a bit of work with one of these boroughs on some bit of project to do with a, a playing field to get built. And this playing field was getting built. Uh, so it's just like a field, and he'd sort of put down on expenses a new Land Rover, which is the wife had been driving around. Now, you might think that that's, um, you know, quite funny, but the joke was on us, because when me and um, this other guy went up to visit him, he was driving, we, he, we sort of said, oh, can you pick us up from the station, because it was in a kind of obscure place, and you know, of course, it's in London, you don't bring cars to work, do you, normally, if you're working right in central London. And he came and picked us up in his death trap, I don't know what, it's like a Granada or something, but it's like a really old one. Uh, yeah, so this Chris Postostomo, he got the last lap because he did almost kill us. You know, like if you were driving around this car, you'd think, oh my God, why can't we just let left the Land Rover, let him have the Land Rover? Because, but then he wasn't bringing it to work. He was letting his wife use it. That's what I heard anyway. Again, lots of bentness, bentness, people paying invoices multiple times over on roads where they're only in charge of three or four roads and they managed to resurface a great big long tract of miles of road three times over and pay for it. You know, it's bent. It's very bent, right? But anyway, so you learn to just sort of ignore things, be disgusted, but you just don't really say anything. Now, moving moving forward a little, moving forward a little bit, what happened was um, 
there was this thing about the legal, the legal question, but that wasn't really flying. Now, I didn't really have anything to do with it, but I know it wasn't flying. And I know that the whole point is like this barrister, to be fair to him, he would have been obviously demanding all this information if there was going to be a court case. And they were like trying to push for a court case, remember, because they, they don't like to make decisions. They like to always blame it on somebody who they've paid a lot of money for. Yes, yeah, so then they could say, well, we, we did the best we could, so, which is that's the way it works in the public sector. But you see, the thing, the, th the thing with this, this, this barrister and stuff like, if there'd been a case, they would have had to get all this information. So that's probably what was pushing it. I'm just guessing. But she didn't want to hand them over. Next thing you know, everybody's emails have disappeared off the system. Not for like from like last week, but you know, a few weeks back or a month back, because it was an email that I actually needed and I couldn't find it for something else. And that's what made me realise all my emails had gone. And everybody's emails have gone, or to the best of my knowledge, everybody's emails have gone. So you've got like 10,000 employees working in these offices doing bits and pieces, and all their emails are gone. Yeah? So she's presumably got rid of all these emails just to stop her getting lumbered with this problem. That's what, looking, looking back at it, I think that's what happened. And there was another incident that then happened. L later on, um, there was a situation where... Um, Oh, what was it? Give me a second. Just let me think for once. Yeah, I'm very sorry. Um, related to the same thing, in streets management, which was what I was working for, you know, the roads, the strategic road network, there was what's called the contracts and procurement department. And the contracts and procurement department had um, about, I reckon, maybe like 50 people working in it. Now, the consultancy engineering contract, not the term maintenance contract, that wasn't what I'm going on about, but the actual uh, standard agreement that they had which they had with all these consultant engineers, you know, like probably rates of pay, all that type of stuff that would, they'd agree to. So they'd say, right, go and do 10 hours of work on this thing or go and do this thing. They'd already agreed this stuff up front. And normally the um, consultant, engineer, consultant engineers companies would have priced up their hourly rate or whatever against this. You know, it's that type of contract. So it's a consultancy agreement. This isn't the term maintenance contract. And um, we were like, right, so where is it? And they're like, oh, we don't seem to have it. And you're thinking, hang on a minute, right? All of this stuff would have been between the consultant engineer and yourself anyway, and it would have been multiple ones. They all knew there was a claim anyway, um, and you obviously got full disclosure of documents if anything legal happens anyway. But the whole point is they were saying, oh, it's a bit embarrassing. We don't really want to phone them up and ask them. Now, I can understand that. You wouldn't want to do that. But this is, this is the point. This is £50 million. Pounds. That's what the accrual is. That's what it's said on paper. But they didn't want to... They didn't want to um, they, they didn't want to effectively behave properly. But, you know, you can understand that they might play, play a bit pedestrian, just leave it a bit. But then again, so we'll, we'll just let them off with that one. Just pretend that's not an issue. If you've got a, a contract which has gone out to maybe 10 consultant engineers to price, to, you know, because they'll be on your framework, you're going to have given it to various different managers for various different sections. What is a huge road network? You've got all the different subordinates of them. These things are going to be flying around on emails. Um, you often get confusion because you get like drafts and stuff get mi mixed, messed up. Basically, you know, like you, you, it's it's not normally as organised as what you think. But then you've got fifty people working in the contracts and deport contracts and procurement department for. Uh, I believe it was just for streets. Maybe it was surface transport. I don't know because they changed the sort of terminology around. And surface transport, of course, is a wider deal. But the point is. If it was one or the other, the consultancy agreement would be the kind of thing next to the term maintenance agreement. You, 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 you wouldn't like just misplace it. It's impossible. That went missing, right? So you've got... I'm not... You can't ever say for sure, because of course, you know, short of like... Well, what, what can you do? You, you, they're not going to admit to doing this. But the point is, so you've got not wanting to give emails over, and then talking about getting legal counsel to decide whether they could get their own employee to give over their work that they did at work. Yeah. That's one. <laughs> then you've got um, all the emails disappearing and they're saying we can't get them back. We just can't get them back. It's a service agreement. It's 16, I think something ridiculous, like £16,000 per email, you know, that we, sorry, per email uh, account that we get rejigged. Sorry, I'd forgotten about that. It was some ridiculous amount of money, huge amount, said it's a surface level agreement and we just got to pay it. And it's like, no, you don't. If they just disappear off the system, that's their liability, not your liability. Again, they've got people working in their computer, people all over the place. The, the, there's no way it could go missing and it would be backed up all over the place. Absolutely impossible. And then you've got this fact that the contracts and procurement department on a term maintenance contract, which is worth, you know, billions, 
have lost the consultancy agreement that's bolted onto that, which you pay the consultants who do work for you on it. So there's three incidents, and the thing that they've all got in con um, common, apart from the fact that they all, well, well, they're basically around the same subject area, which was this contract price fluctuation thing, and the fact that we had a cl incoming claim from the contractors. There'd been a dodge up on that that contract with the consultant engineers. There was a guy called Archie Torrance, actually, I remember now. I remember his name, and he'd apparently been the one who the consultant engineer, who was Atkins Global, had blamed for losing this. You know. They basically said, oh, Archie was the person dealing with it. But no one ever got to speak to Archie. So Archie, you know, basically we never saw him. Apparently he was always sick every time anyone phoned up. I don't really know. I don't know the details. But every single thing was around this contract track price fluctuation issue. And, of course, you've got to remember the other thing is if there's been one claim on a job which pertains to the consultancy agreement, let's say there's another problem that crops up in the final accounts, which you don't know about yet, which they haven't mentioned yet. Yeah, there's, 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 there's going to be more. And if there's going to be more, then, you know, like it's going to put people off looking into it. So it's going to be this sort of opposite of proper contract management. It's just going to completely put people off looking at anything properly. And the whole point is if you work for the public sector, which is a public sector company, remember, TFL. It's not like a quango or anything. You're, 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 not, you're not allowed... You're not allowed to just hand things in, even though they do it every single time. You're not allowed to hand things in and just go, oh, we just made an agreement. We couldn't be bothered to look at the details. We just think it's this. Oh, you're on the next contract anyway. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll agree over a game of golf or whatever. They're not meant to do that type of stuff. And they completely employ thousands of people to make it not necessary because all this stuff's record. There's record keeping, rigorous record keeping. So what they've done is they've effectively destroyed the entire process over, you know, the very minimum of £50 million on paper accrual, um, they've completely blown out any opportunity to completely negate that claim and put it onto the consultant engineers, who were also to blame. Like, she bodged it up, but they were to blame as well because she was meant to be watching them, you know? Um, now, whether they actually got in cahoots and there's some kind of, you know, they're all in it together to just fuck the contract up so that they can have a claim, that, that that's totally likely as well. I don't know. But you see, I'm, 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 that's a lot of speculation. All we know is she was in charge of all those three things, and she got like three, three get out of jail free cards, which should never have happened. None, none of them should have happened. And of course, before that, you had this thing about legal action. So that was like a, almost a get out of jail free card because, well, it's it's even more smoking gun. That is actually a smoking gun because it's like you don't need to get legal legal counselling to pay them to tell you that your employee has to hand over their work that they did at your company. I mean. That, that doesn't happen, right? So, all of those things happened around this woman. Um, the woman's name is Dana Skelly, and I'll make another video about Dana Skelly in a minute, which will link to this. I'm, I'm around someone's house at a minute, and they're these kind of people who just start shouting for no reason. So, if it's been a bit broken up, I'm, I'm sorry about that. And it has made it very difficult for me to actually maintain my focus. So, this is all the stuff, how I was linked. You know, I was managing that claim, and I first-hand witnessed all these things. And the next one's going to be more how it links into the hoax and why this certain person is responsible right now, just in case some, there's some kind of problem with the labelling. And the, name is, the lady's name is Dana Skelly, and now she is head of surface transport for Transport for London. Right? It is Tuesday, the 12th of August, 2014. I've been Tom Carhill, and the next bit's going to be getting uploaded in a minute. Um, any questions or comments, please get in touch with me. I know a wealth more about this than what I could possibly convey in a video. Because when you've worked for a company for a long time, or two years, it's long enough, you, you pick a lot of stuff up and you you can't, it's very difficult for you to explain it because you, you know the bits and pieces are important, but there's probably other things that you can dig into, but I wouldn't be able to think about them because of so many things. Okay, anyway, thanks very much. I've been Tom Carhill. Yeah, it's Tuesday the... Tuesday the 12th of um, August 2014. Um, uh, I'd like to hear your comments anyway, but there's going to be another follow-on video for this. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.